Praise the Lord. We're his, he's ours. Amen. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, just a note from Brother Joe. Talked to, or he texted me yesterday and wanted to let everybody know that the pastor's conference in Belize went very well. It just went great and everything got accomplished that they set forth to do. And he's looking forward to being back to give you a report on what all happened and what all happened there in the lives of the pastors. And I know we're looking forward to that. And uh, also just continue to be praying for him and Sister Cassidy and the team for safe travel back as they head back and uh, be lifting up in prayer. And I know he thanks you already for the prayers that you've already been lifting up on him and those pastors' behalf. Well, there was a pastor in a small church and there was a little mischievous little five-year-old boy that was part of that church. And so the pastor went up to this little mischievous five-year-old boy and said, son, I heard your mother says prayers for you every night. Yes, sir, he does. And so the pastor says, well, what, what does she say in that prayer? The little boy replied, thank God he's in bed. <laughs> so we all have something that we can take comfort in, amen? The Lord comforts us in various ways, whether they're big or small, and we need to take note of that type of comfort. And so uh, as we do, we're going to be looking this morning at comfort and have entitled it Comfort, Pay It Forward. You can't pay it back because the Lord gives us comfort, but you can sure pay it forward and be able to bless other people. We referred to a couple of passages, especially in our 301 class that are in this, but I've never really preached the whole section that this is found in context of, just various verses in that particular context of verses. And in these five verses it says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we'll be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a couple of words here that are important for us to note. In case you didn't say, uh, you know, repetition's the key to learning, uh, if the Lord's trying to tell us anything in these five verses, he kind of makes it obvious that he's talking about comfort, all right? I was kind of having a little fun. You know how you do these little word searches, you know, and you circle them, you have to find the word. Well, I just did that. I said, I'm just going to find the word comfort in these particular passages. You say, why so much repetition of this word comfort? It's because there's a lot of repetition of these words, these other words as well. There's a lot of affliction. There's a lot of suffering, a lot of affliction, a lot of suffering. Those words are also repeated in this passage as well. Why? Because we walk through a lot of hard times. You know, the Christian life is not saying, well, I'm going to come to know the Lord so I can avoid hard times. You know, it's having the Lord's comfort in the midst of hard times. See, we're not exempt, just like the world's not exempt from difficulty. However, we, unlike them, have all these words of comfort, and not only words of comfort, the actual comfort that Paul is speaking about. So if you're in this realm of just saying, you know what, everything always goes great for me, I never have any difficulties, well, you can probably tune me out. And, uh, if, and if that's you, uh, you're remarkable, because most people walk through difficult times. And obviously these people in Corinth were walking through difficult times, suffering, afflictions, and various type of trials. And so we see that God has a purpose and a plan for suffering and affliction, and we're going to begin to look at that way that we can pass it forward. So let's analyze the first part. First of all is the source of our comfort. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. He identifies who he is. He's the God of the Father of, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, the Father of mercies. That means he's the originator. 
If you say the father of golf, you mean the person that started golf. If you say the father of aerodynamics, he's the person that started aerodynamics. I mean, the person that uh, is the father of carpentry, he started that. So to be the uh, father of this, this particular means he's the originator. He's the source. He's where all mercy and comfort originates from, from him. Not only is he the father, that means he's where mercy begins. He's also the God of all comfort. That is our source of all comfort that we get. Well, who and what does he do? He comforts us in all of our tribulation. That, that's where he gives it. He, he's the source by which we get it. He starts out that, th- that whole passage saying blessed, which is the Greek word lulagetos, which is where we get the word eulogy, to speak well of somebody. And so he says, I want to eulogize God. I want to, not that God's dead. God, we know that God's alive. But he's going to speak well of somebody even alive, and that's God to say, look, he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the father of all mercies, and he's the God of all comfort. He's speaking well of God. So he starts out saying something about God. And listen, if your goal is to be Christ-like, then your goal is to be a comforter. You can't have one without the other because God is just a God of mercy and comfort. And if we won't be like him in our character, we also must be a comforter. The word comfort is the Greek word, which means to come alongside, to help. That's where we get the word, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He comes alongside to help, and that's this word. The English word comfort comes from two Latin words, meaning with strength. I don't know about you, but you, when times when I've needed comfort the most and somebody's given comfort to me, they brought me strength when I had none. They brought me comfort. And so here we can see that the Holy Spirit, when Jesus left, he said, I am going to send you a comforter. Wasn't that neat that the Lord would leave us, but he said, I want to send you comfort. And the name of him is the comforter, the Holy Spirit the one who will come alongside and help you. Well, praise the Lord that the Lord hasn't left us without comfort. And then he goes on to say the reason for our comfort. Who comforts us in all of our tribulation? So that. This is the passage we've mentioned in 301 and some other things about tribulations. He gives the reason here for comfort. Now just think about it for a while in our own human understanding. Listen to what this verse would say. He comforts us, that's God, in all of our afflictions so that you can almost figure out in our mind if we would have wrote it, you know that we didn't write it, man didn't write it, the Holy Spirit through men wrote it. How would we have finished off this sentence? Well, he comforts us in our afflictions so that we'll feel and and have comfort. Right? I mean, why else would you comfort somebody unless for them to be comforted? That just makes sense to me that that's how this passage I would think, would finish. God, you comfort me because you look down upon me and you see my affliction. You have mercy, you have compassion, and you comfort me so that I'll be comforted. That's not how it ends. He comforts us in any affliction with the comfort so that we'll be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now hold on. God, you comfort me for a reason. I don't know how many reasons he has. The only reason he has here for doing it is one reason. So that I'll be able to comfort somebody else. So that I'll be able to pass it forward. That's why God comforts. We're the conduit. We're the pipe by which God is going to be able to send comfort to somebody else. We can pass it along with the comfort we ourselves receive to God. Many of you have either as a child or yourself or whatever have seen or been in a relay race, a a track relay race. It's it's where you have maybe four or five people on the track, they're stationed at different places and the first guy gets a baton and you run to a certain part of the track and your goal is to hand the baton to the next runner who takes it, runs a portion of the race, hands the baton to another racer, and they go around the track handing it off, and then the last guy with the baton finishes the race, hopefully in first place, and beats the rest of the team. Now, 
if the referee or the official hands you your baton and you start running and you say, you know what, I'm probably faster than that second guy, I'm just gonna pass him up. And then you pass up the second guy and the third guy and the fourth guy and you win the race. You'll be disqualified because that race says you can't do that. Yeah, but I won, I beat all the rest of the guys. You lost and everybody on your team lost because you didn't pass off the baton of comfort. You were given that baton for a reason so that you could run and hand it off to somebody else and they could take that comfort and hand it off to somebody else. That's the Christian race to say, God, I have a purpose for being comforted and that's to give it to somebody else. Well, how do I give it? We're with the comfort you received of God. You know what you got, just give it to somebody else and that's that passing off. You see, you know why the dead sea's dead? It has no tributary out of it. It's the lowest place on earth, so water only goes to it. It's so low sea level, no lower place in sea level, it can't run off anywhere else and so therefore it's dead. So is true with us. If you just take that comfort and say, you know what, that sure felt good. Woo, praise the Lord, that comfort from God felt good. Thank you, Lord, I got it from here. God said, you missed part of this whole reason I even comforted you. And it's a conviction to us to not let it stay there. You know, it says in verse six, we'll skip five, because verse six says basically the same thing. And if we're afflicted, it's for what? It's for your comfort and salvation. This salvation has to do with sanctification the sanctification part of our salvation. In other words, I'm, helping com I'm being comforted so I can comfort you and help you along your way to grow in Christ because I know how you're feeling because I've been through that same thing you're walking through and God comforted me so I'm gonna help you the best I can and how I was comforted to help you along in your sanctification and, your, your, and in your comfort. And if we are comforted, it is for, it's for what? It's for your comfort. I like what A.T. Robertson says. He says here, Paul here gives the purpose of affliction in the preacher's life, in any Christian's life, to qualify him for ministry to others. And a lot of people say, I wish I was qualified to do ministry. If I was, I'd do some ministry. This is how you got qualified. You were in some sort of affliction God either directly or through somebody else helped you and you got comforted. Now you've made your way through that ordeal. You're feeling better. Things are better. Things are working out better. And now you're qualified. He said, I hadn't been to seminary. I hadn't been to Bible college. But you have just been qualified to do ministry. So I don't know how to do it. Just do what they did for you. Just repeat that. That's what it's asking for here. We're qualifying for ministry. You say, but this sounds like they're doing it for other people. Well, that's what your spiritual gift was for. 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Do you know what your spiritual gift is for? It's not for you. It's for somebody else. Say, well, Brother Tim, I'm getting upset here. My comfort isn't for me, it's for somebody else. My spiritual gift is not for me, it's for somebody else. I know, but if you're in church, you're gonna get comforted by other people and other people's spiritual gifts are gonna minister to you. See, you're just giving, giving, giving and they're giving, giving, giving and you're getting recipient of it and you're giving of it. But none of it's for you. It's all for others, but you're the recipient because you're in the body of Christ. You know, I've often wondered when I read this about the reason God comforted me. You know, being from the school business, uh, we know that, well, it's supposed to be this way, that if you don't pass the objective of a particular class, let's say algebra, you didn't learn the objective of that class, which is to be able to use algebra well enough, or at least 70% of it, and you don't get it, then we have a little program for you 
called summer school. No swimming pools. No water skiing. No outside playing in the backyard. Because you didn't and you decided I'm not going to do the objective that the teacher set for summer school, I mean for algebra, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to pass the objective. Then we have you a program that you can spend your summers trying it again and see if you can get it this time. As I read that passage, I'm wondering if the Lord said, Tim Strickland, I comforted you that last time so you'd be able to comfort others and you didn't comfort anybody with it. I think I may send you back through summer school. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Lord, I, I don't want to go through that again. No, 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 I, I learned, I learned. Well, it didn't look like you learned. So let's have another affliction for you. And maybe you'll get it this time. I said, Lord, I don't need another one. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to learn your objective that you said here in Scripture that you have my comfort for a reason. And then there's also the abundance of comfort. A lot of people say, well, I'm not getting comfort from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, we have suffering that we do because we're Christians. Because Christ suffered, we'll suffer. That's an abundance. But also, our comfort is abundant through Christ. This word abundance has to do with a river overflowing. If I'm not being comforted, it's definitely not because there's not enough comfort to go around. Because God's got a river overflowing with the stuff. It's just pouring out, oozing out. It's so much in abundance. So if I'm not getting comfort in my situation, it's definitely because it's not there. The key is going to be, you've got to be connected to Christ and you've got to be connected to the body of Christ. What do you mean connected to Christ? Me and him as we're one in salvation. In other words, if I've never given my life to Christ, I need to be connected to him. And then also after that, I need to be connected to a body of Christ. That's the church. Connected. I didn't say attending. I said connected. There's a difference there. Why do I need to be so connected? How on earth am I going to know who needs comfort? Do you think you can run in here on Sunday morning and run out and know who's all dealing with all kind of issues? Don't you have to have some perspective? If you're going to carry out this verse, how on earth can you do it? If you don't know who's hurting, who's suffering, you've got to know you've got to be connected enough with the body. If here and here you say, well, I can't know that. No, you can't carry out this verse. You wonder where your comfort's not coming. Because you hadn't used the last comfort to comfort others. A golfer don't go, doesn't go to the ocean to play golf. He goes to the golf course because that's where golfing happens. The only way to find out where God's people are is to be connected to God's people through his church so I can find out. Not only can I find out, I can use it. Most people don't have enough time just in a few minutes here to, to hear about who needs and to do that type of comforting. See, God already knows our weaknesses and he's already made provision for it in his church. Do you know the church is the body of Christ? He is the head, and we're all these body parts. We're hands, we're arms, we're elbows, we're feet. We are the body of Christ as he is the head. And the body of Christ has already made provision for your weakness. See, I'm 54, but last year I had to get prescription. Well, y'all got fuzzy right there. It I had to get prescriptions for the first time. And it was amazing to me because the, the guy at the eye doctor you know, said, well, you're going to need stuff that you're going to be able to see far away, up here, midway right here, and real up close right here. I thought I was always going to be going like this. You know, and he said, no, your brain will get adjusted to it after a while. And so God gave somebody the wisdom to come up with that technology in these glasses. Because my eyes a week. But then, what's amazing was that God made my body with, instead of just a hole here and a hole here and flat and just a flat face, God made my body so that I had something to hook with this, hook with this, and rest that thing right there on that nose. I 
I know I'm simple, but I just, I sit down and think of stuff like that just all the time. It's like, God, you just, you know, you foresue, which is not a word, that I needed something to rest my glasses on. Because even if somebody invented it, if my body couldn't accommodate that, but it's almost like God knew that I would have weak eyes and he made this thing, he could have made it breathe, but he made it stay out to hold that and hook right there. And I can look down and just, he made, now see my eyes are still weak. He has never changed that. But he gave me a body that would help me overcome my weakness. And now I can see well. Not perfect, but I can see well. And a lot of people, they fuss and they cuss at what God isn't doing. And he said, you are not connected to my body. You, your glasses are falling off, so to speak. I've given the body of Christ to accompany and help you in your weakness. But God, you're not taking away my weakness. And he neither did it with my eyes. But he gave me a body to accommodate it and he gave us the body of Christ. And so don't fuss, but just get connected and find out all that he has for us in the body. It's there for our benefit as well as the benefit of others. And then there's the blessing of giving others comfort. We mentioned part of this verse ahead of time, but we go back to it in verse six. But if we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. For our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. See, even Paul and Timothy knew as pastors that they were always comforting other people in the body of Christ. But you know what? Those people in turn were comforting them back because they were sharing in the same suffering, therefore they were sharing in the same comfort. I look out, as many of you have personally comforted me through what God led you through. And you've been a personal comfort to me. And I'm able to maybe turn that back around and personally comfort you. Because we're sharing in all this. We're all comforting back and forth. We're all sharers. None of us are going to ever arrive. None of us are ever going to be pain-free, suffering-free, affliction-free. But praise God. God, he's given us one another to share. Some versions say to be partners in our suffering, partners in our comfort. As we comfort one another and share with one another and, and minister to one another because we're always looking to be sharing. I know Brenda Ellis lost a, a, many people in her family at one time through death. And God led her through that suffering to be able to start a ministry called Grief Share. You ever thought of the name? Sharing in grief. They can't take it away from you, but they can share in it and take part of that burden away from you and let me have some of it. And even though it was a tough period on her life, it birthed a ministry of saying, hey, let me share with you because I know exactly what you're going through. See, you know exactly what a lot of people are going through too because God led you through that. I don't know about you. I don't like to share my dessert, but I'll sure share my grief. <laughs> Anytime I'm going through anything, if you want to come help out, relieve it, you come on. I'll share that. Because God's made the church that way so we can be in that sharing process together. Comforting others. It's going, to take, uh, it's going to take a couple of things. If you're serious about doing this, if you really believe the Word says, if you're going to get comforted by God, you need to be comforting other people because that's why God's going to send it to you. Then it's going to take a few things on you and ours part. First of all, it's going to be desire. You've got to want to. You know what I found out in life? Everybody does what they want to do. 
I mean, two drops may keep somebody out of church, but a hurricane, a monsoon, and 14 floods will not keep people away from some event they want to go to. I mean, they'll get a four-wheel drive and go through the flood. I mean, they're going to get there because they say, I want to. So it's not a matter of qualification because you just got qualified if you've been comforted already, just comfort everybody else that way. So it's not a matter of qualifications, it's a matter of simply, I desire to help one another. Say, Brother Tim, I, I just don't know the words to say. You know, somebody's hurting, somebody's going through a difficulty, somebody needs help, I just don't know what to say. How many guys in this room have ever went to, through Lama's training? Raise your hand up. Have you ever been through Lama's training? All right. Well, you can visit my grief with me. Now, that, was in, that wasn't even invented in America. That was a Frenchman, Ferdinand Lamaz. And so he developed this thing where women could have some natural childbirth, and as long as they went through this little training with their husbands, it'd be all fine and dandy. <laughs> Wikipedia definition, not all of it. I'll just read part of what di Wikipedia says. It's designed to, and I quote, help pregnant women understand how to cope with pain. <laughs> pregnant women are going, that guy ought to be shot. <laughs> I start over. To help pregnant women understand how to cope with pain that both facilitate labor and promote comfort. Included focused breathing. So Rebecca and I, we sign up for Lamaze back in the 80s and we're getting ready, you know, to go to these classes and hours and hours and hours of this training of which a large part is you as the husband as coach, you got to keep coaching your wife to breathe properly. <laughs> no, 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 it's like this. No, you're not doing it right. Oh, there you go, that's right, that's right. So I get my scrubs, you got, you got scrubs with on the back it said coach. <laughs> so once you get to Lamaze, that's your diploma. I'm ready now. So off we go, baby's ready. Here we are in delivery, and so there I am, right there doing my thing. I got trained, I'm ready. Okay, ready. Well, as that pain started getting up there and up there and up there and up there, my sweet, adorable, polite, well-mannered, never gets upset with anything, left the room. Because <laughs> that pain was shooting up there, and she didn't really say much, but I could gather. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I could gather kind of what was going on. Look, buddy, you're half responsible for this pain I'm going through. And number two, I'm old enough to know how to breathe on my own. <laughs> now, she didn't say that, but everything in her being was like... <laughs> and it was just about time for me to shut up. Because I was going, okay, you're not breathing right. You go, <laughs> and I didn't, I thought I'd better back up before I got it. Because the pain, the breathing stuff was not helping me. And I thought, it's time to just be there for her and not say anything. Hold her hand, maybe rub her head and just shut up. My little smart deal about how to breathe was not going. You know, you don't have to know what to say because that was the comfort that she got from me the rest of the time. Not what I said, just being there. See, that's sometimes all you need to do. It's just desire to be there. Desire to say, what can I do? And maybe it's nothing but just to listen or to be there. And if they say something to do, then do that. You don't have to wait for all these words and fancy words and theological words and scripture and all that. It's good to give scripture. I'm not saying that we do. But just be there first. Maybe the verse or something, if God leads you to, will come later because it's hidden your heart. And so just the desire and not the qualifications to know what to say or what to do because people aren't looking for a theological lesson at this time. You do realize that? They're looking for somebody to be there to comfort them. And then it's also going to require something else. It's going to require time. 
We have busy schedules. And not necessarily their evil schedules. I mean, shopping and groceries and cars and this and that. It's, it's not that it's evil things we're doing. We're just busy. And it's going to take some time. On January the 10th, 2007, Terry Dreyer capsized his boat out in the ocean. He was in the water for 20 hours. Later on, he said, I just knew I was going to die. There was nobody out there. I'm in the water. I'm, I can't hold on very long. I'm going to die from either hypothermia or drowning or whatever. I, I was, he was just making plans to end it all. He's no help. And a helicopter spotted him and radioed back to a Navy ship of his location. That Navy ship was on its way to the battle areas of the Persian Gulf. And that Navy ship pulled up and got Terry Dreyer out of the water. And the doctor on board that ship was able to bring him back and he fully recovered. A Navy ship that was on the way to a very important appointment, the Persian Gulf, a necessary appointment, a valuable appointment, a real appointment, but it would deviate from that schedule to pull over and rescue one man. Oh, did I mention the name of the ship? The USS Comfort was the name of that ship on January the 10th, 2007. We are the USS Comfort. Headed out to find people, but it will require you to deviate from your Persian Gulf destination sometime. Say, so you know what? I'm going to have to put that on hold just a minute because this person needs me. Because all of our appointments are valuable. And even if it's super point, maybe you can say, hey, I've got to go right now, but I'm going to call you right back and we'll finish this. It's going to require some time. But you know, some people can minister to people even better than even sometime a pastor. We minister to people all the time, but there's times when I've said, you know what? There's a member in this body who's gone through that exact thing. And I like to give you their name. Now, you don't have to go through something to comfort somebody, but it sure helps a lot. Because you can say, man, I know exactly what you're feeling because I've been exactly where you are. That's what we need to be. We need to be references so that people will know our testimony. And it's all by grace. We getting and giving comfort, it's all by grace. I believe there's abundance. But you have to do it God's way. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Texas unclaimed list. It's a list. You can go on, on, online and there's... there's Three billion dollars in a fund in Texas that belong to you. The Texans, the taxpayers of Texas. That companies has either overcharged you, they found they made a mistake and they owe you money, you overpaid, they made a mistake on their books and they can't locate you to give you or somebody has an inheritance for you and they can't locate you. All this is funneled into one Texas unclaimed pool. And right now it sits at $3 billion. It's ours. And, and our oldest daughter, Rachel, called me and said, hey, I found you, us, it was only about $60, and my mom about $250. She was just, had some time one day and was, and so she, we got the paperwork. Now, now we have to fill out all the paperwork, send it in, and we get our money back. We get to claim the unclaimed. You know, I wonder how much the pool of comfort is out there that's unclaimed. Do what? Oh, who do you ask? <laughs> Forget about the comfort. I want the money. <laughs> so if you want to claim your unclaimed money, fill out the paperwork and help Mercy find it online. But if you want your unclaimed comfort, Get busy comforting others. Because I don't know if this is how it works, but I wonder if God said, you're not doing it. You're not passing it on. We've got to pass it on. 
We've got to give it to others. So it's either that we're not plugged into the church to get it from other people, or we're in the church and the people who ought to be comforted aren't, and our church does a great job at it. We just need to always be reminded what to do. Or simply, we're not doing it God's way. We're not filling out the paperwork, so to speak. We need to be giving, giving, giving. The Bible says, not just of money, give and it shall be given to you. Amen. It. It can be comfort too. You give it, you'll get it. And I, don't, I know I've been guilty of sometimes saying, God, whew, I am worn out now. I am in need of comfort. And then the Lord puts me in a situation to give some more. What you do is just give some more because God's going to find a way to give it to you. Even though you're drained, you're saying, look, I'm the one right now who needs to be getting comfort. That's the time to really be giving it because it'll make you feel better. Some people that are going through the lowest of lows of lows of lows saying, I just can't get out of it. I am not a joyful person. I'm a miserable person. I'm an angry person. I'm just not very joyful. Well, then start giving to others. And the more you comfort them, and more you comfort them, the more you reach out, you'll find out it brings you joy. Because you're focused not on your comfort, but the comfort of others. You know, we started this whole sermon out with that word, blessed, which we get our English word eulogy from. Eulogetos in the Greek, which we get eulogy. To speak well of somebody. Do you know you and I right now are writing our eulogy? They said, no, Brother Tim, my children and relatives will write it once I'm dead. No, they'll write it down on paper. But you're writing it right now in reality to give them something to write down. Well, I'll have them where I worked and where I did this, where I got my education. Is that what speaks well of you? I'll tell you what, you ask somebody, does that mean a lot to you? No, but I'll tell you what, if you go down in your eulogy and people said, I can say one thing about them, they were a comforter and I'm gonna miss them immensely because they were always a comfort to me. That's what you want people to say about you. So I can't say much, but I can say one thing, they were a comforter. They were always comforting people. Eulogy. How you doing and checking on people and loving people, that's what God wants us to be. I can't pay back God for all that he's done for me. I can't pay back you for what you've done for me, but I can pass it forward. I can pay it forward. I can say I can give you part of what God's given me. That's why God has a tithe. I'm gonna give you and you give. I'm gonna give you comfort and you give. It's just the plan of God. See, some are here this morning and you haven't got the ultimate comfort, which is salvation. You know, it said he's the God of all mercies. That means he has not given us what we deserve. We deserve hell, we deserve judgment, we deserve all that. But God's mercy was laid upon us through Christ Jesus our Lord. And he showed us the greatest comfort of all by forgiving us of our sins. I don't know about you, but when Christ forgave your sins, you should have felt much comfort because he was the God of all mercies. But one day, if we stand before him when we don't know him, we're going to see him as the God of judgment because he will cast that judgment, guilt or innocence. And it won't be based on am I a good person or a bad person who done 14 sins or 114 or 114,000. It'll be based on do you know my son as your savior personally? If you haven't done that, then you haven't experienced his mercy and his ultimate comfort in forgiving your sins. So this morning we begin to look at our life for non-Christians to come to know Christ as their Savior and experience that. And for the rest of us, nothing we probably said up here we, we didn't know before, but we've got to be reminded to keep doing it. Have I been doing this? Have I been taking what comfort I've already got and used it to try to help comfort others? You know, when we talked about not knowing the words to say, some people comfort other people in various ways. You need some help over there with that car? Let me come over and help you. You're, in a, you're all nervous, you're all wrecked, you're all... Let me help you there. 
man, your wife's in the hospital. That must be a lot of stress on you. Let me run down here and uh, I'll mow your yard. I mean, there, there's a immense way to comfort people. You know, sometimes it's just in service. Sometimes it's in words. Sometimes it's in whatever. Hey, how can I relieve a little of your pain? How can I help? Can I pull some of that burden off of you? Can I take some of your responsibility? Can I take some of that load off? Can I do some? It can be in those ways as well. A lot of time people comfort that way. Praise the Lord he's given us a church, which I pat you on the back because I've seen you, not only your ministry to me, I've seen it to you, to one another, and to each other. And it makes the pastors proud to see people comforting one another. It doesn't always have to come from the leadership. It's so neat seeing the body of Christ comforting and ministering to each other. Oh, I believe when Christ looks down and see his body working with his headship where the body's comforting one another, I believe that so pleases him. Why? Because we're his children. And when a dad sees a brother and a sister, a sister and a sister comforting each other, it blesses their heart. And so this morning, may we need to be reminded, you know, Lord, I need to keep comforting other people. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you'd stand to your feet right where you are.